We've all used the expression hanging by a thread to describe to someone how precarious a situation was. Well, this window washer is literally hanging by a thread, but he doesn't see his situation as being particularly precarious or dangerous, no more than the spider does, who's hanging for a thread from his web. Both are suspended on the ends of cables, and the load on the cables, the weight of the window washer or the spider, has a tendency to stretch the cable. Now, this is what we call tension, and tension is what this program is all about. And structures that use tension, like the stretched cables, can be both strong and very useful. So far in this series, we've seen many man-made examples of structures, mostly buildings and bridges. And most of these rely on compression, and that is the squashing together of different parts for their strength and stability. In the natural world, however, we find quite a different scene. Most of the structures in nature rely on tension rather than compression for their form. For example, the roots of plants and trees work just like the rope holding the window washer. They are stretched under tension, stopping the plant from being pulled out of the ground. And, of course, bats' wings are stretched. So are our vocal cords and our muscles and tendons. Here's a skeleton. It belongs to an unlucky window washer. Now, it's not his complete structure. If it were, we wouldn't need all sorts of pins and wires to hold him together when he's on display like this. Without those pins and wires, he'd be little more than a pile of disconnected bones on the floor. Now, the things that hold the bones together in living creatures are the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments, and they're all under tension. In other words, they're part of the structure too, and their precise location and size is what determines much of the final shape of people, like our friend here once had. We can find many examples of tension around us too. Fishing lines behave just like the rope. Things hang from construction cranes. That's tension. The rigging of a tall ship that lets you pull the sails up and keeps the masts and spars from falling down is all under tension. As are the ski lifts that take people to the tops of the slopes they want to ski down. And of course, the wires and cables that carry telephone conversations, cable TV and electricity are just stretched cables under tension. Stringed musical instruments wouldn't work without being under tension. In fact, the amount of tension for any particular kind of string determines the note it will make. The more tension, the higher the pitch. And apparently, the Roman officers in charge of those wonderful catapults used to have a very good musical ear. They had to listen for the right note, so they'd know whether their catapult was tensed enough to throw its load all the way to the enemy stronghold they were trying to hit. But while we've used tensed strings for both instruments of music and destruction, it's taken us a long time to use strings and cables and wires to any extent in our buildings. One of the reasons, of course, is that tensile structures in nature aren't very stable. They tend to blow around in the wind and even shake and bend under the weight of the creatures climbing on them. That's because they are lightweight. Well, that's all right in nature, because insects and blades of grass don't mind blowing about in the wind. But by and large, we do mind if the buildings we live and work in move around too much. Nevertheless, we have built structures where we have used tension to great advantage because a structure in tension weighs less. For instance, any structure has to be strong enough to support its own weight before it can start supporting other loads. And structures that use compression are very heavy. <laughs> 
So if we want to span a very large gap or space, say with a bridge across a wide river, and we want to use compression, as in an arch, we soon find that a single arch would be so heavy it would collapse under its own weight. Now, as I just said, tensile structures are inherently lightweight for their strength. That means we can build bridges to span large gaps using tension. The simplest type of bridge using tension is in fact the ordinary rope bridge. It's just three ropes slung across a gap and firmly anchored to a convenient tree on either side. Then, as we did when I was a boy scout, we've tied the three ropes together with a thinner rope to help all three move as one when you walk on it. And walking on a three-rope bridge gives new meaning to the word unstable. But although it's a bit scary to walk on, it's light in weight and can be built just about anywhere. And in fact, rope bridges are still in common use, often spanning large gorges in rugged mountain country. The same principles that let us build rope bridges are used in the more sophisticated traffic bridges we use to span large rivers. The Lionsgate Bridge in Vancouver is one example. Now, as we've seen before, there is a relationship between a bridge like this and the arch. In many ways, the main cables of this kind of suspension bridge are just arches upside down. The roadway hangs from the main cables. They pass over the high pillars and are then anchored on the shore. Bridges made this way are among the most elegant structures we've devised. And one of the oldest and perhaps most beautiful of suspension bridges is the famous Brooklyn Bridge. Built in 1883, it was designed by the engineer John Roebling, a German immigrant. He had built several suspension bridges before the Brooklyn, including the Niagara in 1850 and the Allegheny in 1860. The Brooklyn Bridge was to be the crowning achievement of his career, but John Roebling died before construction even began. While surveying the site for the towers, his foot was crushed getting out of a boat. He contracted tetanus and died in 1869. So making the design a reality was left to his son, Washington Roebling, who had worked on some of his father's earlier bridges. Ironically, he too met with misfortune on the project. While supervising the excavation in the deep caissons for the towers, 78 feet or 15 meters below high water, Washington suffered a severe attack of the bends. Although he was rendered an invalid for the rest of his life, he continued to oversee every detail of the construction from his bedroom window. The major innovation of the Brooklyn Bridge was the suspension cables themselves. They were made from wire ropes instead of chains. You see, the difficulty had been that for a long spanning suspension bridge, you needed very thick and therefore very heavy cables that were impossible at that time to haul up onto the top of the towers. Roebling's answer was to put several thin, lighter ones up first, then spin other wires around them, resulting in a thick, strong cable. This was, however, a very scary procedure. The cables from the towers were fastened on each side of the river to 23-ton anchor plates buried deep beneath granite anchorage structures weighing themselves 60,000 tons. Once the main cables were finished, suspenders were dropped from which hung the floor beams. Then these suspenders were lashed to the diagonal cable stays by riggers, providing added stability. After 14 years of construction, the Brooklyn Bridge opened on May the 24th, 1883, and it remains in use today. It is a testament to Roebling's philosophy. He often pointed out that nature never wasted material, which is why natural structures are lightweight and beautiful. Therefore, his aim was to build structures that visually express lightness and strength, in this case, the cables and the towers. It is a lasting tribute to two men, father and son, but a footnote is in order. Washington's wife, Emily, not only nursed him after his paralysis, but she also, daily, issued on-site instructions to the workmen. Despite no formal engineering training, she understood Washington's ideas and instructions well enough to interpret them to assistant engineers, often making many critical decisions of her own.
For over a hundred years it has stood, celebrated in song, print, canvas and celluloid. The Roeblings built it six times stronger than necessary, but in 1944, engineers went over the bridge, inch by inch, bolt by bolt, studying the structural integrity. The study took two years. The verdict? The bridge needed a coat of paint. We understand, however, it is still for sale. There has been a recent development in suspension bridge design. The cable stay suspension bridge does away with the long free spanning cables. Instead, the roadway is attached directly to large pillars by many separate cables. These bridges look a bit like the old drawbridges of medieval castles. Well, large and beautiful as all these suspension bridges are, they not only have to be able to cope with the changing loads of the traffic, but also contend with the uncertain loading of the wind. A big suspension bridge blows in the wind quite readily because of its relative light weight. But worse, in certain wind conditions, a suspension bridge can actually resonate like a violin string. That's what happened to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940. Shortly after the bridge was opened to traffic, a wind, not even a very strong one, set the bridge oscillating. The oscillations built up gradually, much the way a child pumps up a swing. In fact, people nicknamed the bridge Galloping Gertie. The oscillations eventually got so big that the bridge disintegrated. Today, scale models of suspension bridges are tested in wind tunnels under many different wind conditions. The designers have to be sure that their full-sized bridges won't suffer the same fate as Galloping Gertie. Nevertheless, all suspension bridges wobble to some extent and the roadbed changes shape. That's especially true if the bridge is putting up with a heavy moving load, such as a train, which is why we never put railway tracks on suspension bridges a train would soon derail. I should mention, though, that two suspension bridges did carry trains, both designed by John Roebling. The first was the Niagara Bridge, on which trains slowly crossed at approximately five kilometres per hour until it was torn down in 1897. The other was the Brooklyn Bridge, which carried first cable cars, then electric trolleys until 1950. Interestingly, the National Research Council in Ottawa tested the Lion's Gate Bridge in a severe 200 km per hour wind, and despite the noticeable motion, the structure remained intact. Of course, when we drive in a vehicle over a suspension bridge, we hardly notice any motion at all. But this sort of motion is more noticeable in a building, and so it's taken a long time to use the suspension principle for buildings. Now, just as there is a relationship between the trusses for bridges and the trusses for roofs, there is a link between suspension bridges and buildings, and it's called the tent, which is a lightweight, relatively unstable structure, if ever there was one. Well, by the way, the word tent comes from the Latin, tenta, which literally means stretched out, which is something I'm having trouble with. So let's start from the beginning. Now, in its most elementary form, the tent's a bit like our rope bridge. The difference is that we have to carry our anchor trees around with us. They are, of course, the tent poles. If I was to stretch a rope between them, it's easy to see that if I just stood them up, the structure would fall down. If I plant the poles firmly in the ground, I might be able to get away with it. But if there is a load that pulls the rope down, the poles cave in. What is better is to use the poles like the pillars of a big suspension bridge, run the rope over the top and anchor it in the ground with tent pegs. The trouble with this is that if a strong wind comes along, the cable could lift upwards into the air. It might even come off the top of the tent poles. How could I stop that from happening? Well, one way I could do it would be to put another cable across this one and anchor it with pegs too. It is called a counter cable. It stops some motion, but wait a minute, 
the poles could still yaw from side to side. Well, I can stop that with some more counter cables near the ends. Now I only need a few external cables or guy wires to keep the thing from blowing away. We can expand the cable system to enclose very large spaces. Say in our simple system we replace the two poles at the ends with two large arches. Then we run a series of stabilising cables from arch to arch and counter cables across the structure. All the cables are stretched. Some pull down and others pull up and out. That is the essence of suspension structures. The result is a large structure that we could use as a covered stadium or arena. However, there are some restrictions. There is lots of height for the seats, but the roof sags in the middle. That might make the building fine for hockey, but useless for soccer or baseball, where the ball could be kicked or hit into the roof. Now this kind of structure will have guy wires or cables pulling out to keep the tension in the roof itself from pulling the arches in and making the whole thing collapse. We also need to anchor all those counter cables that go across the stadium roof. But what if there isn't enough land to stretch the cables out? Well, instead of pulling out from the outside, we can push out from the inside. There are some excellent examples. One of the most elegant is the Dulles Airport Terminal Building in Washington. The roof is supported by hidden suspended cables running between the inclined walls. Incidentally, there is a way to eliminate the inward pull of a suspended roof altogether. Take two circular shapes, a rim and a hub, and stretch cables between them. As we fill in the lines, you might think that what we have is a bicycle wheel, and it is but it could also be the roof of a large building. Several concert halls and arenas have roofs built this way. And what's neat about this structure is that it doesn't need any guy wires to the ground at all. Both rings are being pulled by the stretched cables and serve as the anchors. We call them ring beams and they form a closed system. We can make our auditoriums as high as we want on the sides, and we don't have to worry about pushing or pulling out, just about the downward compression due to the weight of the roof. Back to the original cable system with all those counter cables. We have put them in both directions so that each cable would help stabilise the ones at 90 degrees to it. If we put a great many of them together, I think we've just reinvented canvas. The warp and the weft of the fibres in the fabric are really the tension cables and counter cables that keep the tent stable. It's now a structure and a covering at the same time. There are, of course, more things you can do with tent structures, especially if you use a fabric covering. It acts like a membrane does in living things. That means you can pull it in any direction and it will resist with tension. Now, while small tents have one or two poles, you can just as easily have three poles. Pull the middle of the membrane down and tie it to the ground. This is the essence of the remarkable German pavilion at Expo 67. And the Olympic Stadium in Munich. And those innovative forerunners have spawned many others, like this playground at Ontario Place. Now, these structures are ideal for covering large, odd-shaped spaces because they are flexible and rearrangeable and allow people to move from outdoors to indoors with ease. And now, with newer materials, we can build much bigger and more sophisticated ones and, in combination with other structural forms, create really impressive complexes.
Canada Place is a complex of several buildings with convention spaces beneath the tent-like roof. Also in Vancouver is one of the first office buildings to use the suspension principle in its structure. It is the West Coast Transmission Building. If we look at the building as it was being constructed, we can see that it uses a technique similar to that used in the cable stayed bridges. Just as the roadway on the cable stayed bridge was hung directly by cables that stretched from the central pillars, the floors of the West Coast Transmission Building are suspended from its central tower. A building like this is flexible, not unstable enough to make it unsafe or uncomfortable for the people using it, but more than enough to be able to withstand an earthquake. There are now buildings using this principle all over the world. Ontario Place, while it's not too worried about earthquakes, uses similar ideas of construction to hold some of its buildings off of the ground and give the greatest clearance underneath. Now, let's combine this structural system with the principle of tent structures that we saw earlier. Sailboats use both membrane structures for their sails and the tensioning cables to hold the masts up. And together, they offer us the key to perhaps the strangest tension structure of all, pneumatics. They are like sails on their sides, blown up from below. And they are being used for everything from coverings for tennis courts to the roofs of great stadiums. Pneumatics are attractive as structures because they make the lightest roofs of all for spanning large areas. The only possible problem would seem to be how to get enough air pressure inside the building to hold the thing up. After all, even though it's relatively light, a membrane covering can still weigh a great deal. But it turns out that it takes very little inside air pressure at all to keep the building inflated. Even in large buildings with lots of doors opening and closing, that kind of pressure is easy to maintain with just a few fans blowing air back in. There are some problems, however, to be considered. For instance, one thing sailors know is that if a sail is stressed too much by the wind, it will tear. The sail traps the wind and pressure builds up on one side. In fact, the larger the area of the sail, the less wind it takes to tear the sail from the ropes. And all the built-up tension will be transmitted to the outside edges of the sail. The same is true for a membrane roof over a stadium, such as BC Place in Vancouver. If the pressure is just a bit too high, the roof will rip at the edges. The way to solve that problem is to string cables over the top of the roof. They will be stretched and will serve to hold the roof down, but their most important function is to take some of the stress off the membrane roof itself and transfer it through the cables to the edge of the structure. This means the roof can survive changes in pressure without tearing. You end up with an almost quilt-like look to the roof. Instead of one large curved canvas, you have many smaller bubbles with tighter curves. But why do all these tighter curves stop the roof from tearing? Well, the fact is that the sharper the curve of a membrane, the less stress there is in it. It's why when you put a hot dog into boiling water, it would always split long ways where the curve is the least, as opposed to round it where it's curved the most. Because you see, the hot dog could be considered as a sort of pneumatic structure in that it's covered with a membrane and skin. And in the hot water, the pressure builds up because the air's been heated and it expands. It can't escape through the membrane, of course, and so it proceeds to blow up rather like a balloon. And when it does eventually split there, it split long ways where the curvature is the least, but the stress is the most. That's why this huge roof over BC Place Stadium won't tear, despite being just a few millimetres thick. Air-supported roofs were actually invented in 1910, but it wasn't until about 20 years ago, with the advent of Teflon-coated fiberglass coverings, that these really big but amazingly thin roofs were possible. And throughout the world, these principles are now being used to create all sorts of new structures. The development of pneumatic and suspension structures has added an exciting dimension to the way we enclose space.
These buildings are not only functional, but because of their unconventional appearance, they can add variety to the urban landscape. But let's face it, we don't really see many buildings like this. Most of our buildings, especially in the downtowns of modern cities, tend to be glass and steel towers rising high into the sky. Because skyscrapers allow us to put more and more floor space on less and less ground area. And there are great economic and political pressures to build buildings that are even higher and higher on land that's not only scarce, but very expensive. But how high can we go? And how high should we go? That's the topic of our next programme. How high is up 